thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is George Gersano. I'm the owner and instructor of Fighting Chance in Seattle. Uh, we are a kickboxing and self-defense school. We offer uh, workshops for women. We also offer classes for men and for teens. And we offer specific programs. Um, you know, if you want to come out and talk, you want to come out and do self-defense at your place of employment or for your organization, we do these things as well. Today we're going to talk about the role of intuition in self-defense. We think about self-defense, we think about what physically can we do. And I think, you know, when we talk about a physical application of self-defense, we're at the absolute last step we should be on. Intuition is our, our biggest tool in avoiding situations where we would have to defend ourselves. We have this you know, thing in our society where we really downplay intuition. We kind of view intuition like it's this gender-based thing or it's this mythological thing. Like, oh, it's a woman's intuition, it's a mother's intuition. We kind of downplay it like this kind of cute, magical thing moms and women do. Like, oh, no, no, her feelings, she feels things, it's fine. Or we look at the, you know, the detective movie and we're like, I've got a hunch. And then we're like, oh, no, no, he's got a hunch, it's fine. He's, he's been doing this while, he's got this under control. We very rarely understand that that's actually something we all have inside of us. There's not really any magic to it. It feels magical because it's rad, but it's not actually anything terribly special. It's something all animals come equipped with, and we are no different. The first thing I like to do when I talk about intuition is tell a story that I call Obey Your Monkey Brain. So we have this little monkey wandering around through the monkey jungle on its way home. The monkey does not have front of mind chatter the way we do. So that monkey, on its way home, is not thinking about its monkey life. It's not thinking about the monkey argument they got in that day. It's not thinking, should I text her and let her know I'm sorry so she's not stewing all day? Or is it text too informal and maybe she's going to misread it? Maybe I should just get home fast. Should I buy flowers? None of that. Just walked into this monkey thing thinking whatever it is monkeys think. Probably food and butt scratching later. There's a sudden feeling of panic, absolute terror and fear that clenches up the monkey's chest. We've all felt that something is not right here feeling. What is that? The monkey feels that a couple of things in its environment are not right. It doesn't have front of mind chatter, so there's no filter separating what's actually happening from what it's experiencing. So let's say in the jungle today, there are no sounds of mid-sized animals. Usually there's the insects, usually there's the scurrying animals, and there's bigger animals. There's no sounds in that middle range. Let's say the grass is swaying, tall grass is swaying, stopping and swaying. There's a scent on the air that's not quite right. Maybe four or five other factors line up here. This monkey reacts immediately. The monkey doesn't ever talk itself out of feeling fear. It just goes with it. Crawls up the tree, starts yelling whatever signals you yell here monkey brothers and sisters when like, there's a real situation. And the tiger steps up out of the grass and crawls out. The tiger's been waiting patiently all day. You know, like, why did that happen? And what's the difference between us and the monkey? You know, the monkey felt those things just well, but we have a tendency to rationalize. Where do those feelings come from? So if you uh, ever heard the expression, it's one of my least favorite things people say out loud. Oh, you only use 10% of your brain. You ever heard that? Uh, everybody's heard that. There's a movie out right now called Lucy with Scarlett Johansson and Morgan Freeman about how she accesses more than 10% of her brain and instantly becomes psychic. Uh, it's nothing. Okay. There's nothing up there that we're not using. This is a chunk of organ up there that is using a very substantial portion of our energy. It would evolve out if we weren't using the whole thing. What we're talking about is the difference between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. The automatic function that have us on autopilot, remembering to breathe, remembering to blink, interacting with the environment, our spatial awareness that tells us where are my hands, where are my feet in relation to what's around me. We don't have time to think about any of these things. We can never get anything done if every second you gotta say, oh yeah, blink. My conscious mind can hold, I believe, you know, five to nine things. Depending on you know which TED talk you watch, you're gonna find a different amount of consciousness and items you can hold up there. It doesn't really matter the numbers, you can hold a massive amount of information in your subconscious and pretty much almost nothing in your front of mind consciousness. When we are interacting with our environment, one thing is happening as far as survival is concerned. We are checking what's around us for differences. So all of my data says, this is what my environment normally looks like. These are all of the things I know about my environment. 
if I'm used to this room and there's a door in my peripheral vision and I see that door open, that is the first time I'm going to be aware of that door is there. Because that door is telling me my environment is about to change and I should become aware. If I were privy to all of these decisions, I would never get anything done. I just want to focus about you know, getting a sandwich. Most of my front of my thought is sandwich related. The more time I have to spend on my environment, who is coming in here? How are they walking? How are they moving? Are they a threat to me? We get really far away from realizing we're kind of just monkey stuff. And our first order of business is a threat assessment. When we start getting those signals that go against what we're used to, then we have fear. Okay? We see, oh, that person is not moving correctly. There's something wrong with them. Oh, that man has a knife. People don't normally carry knives. Okay, that's what's going to give us our signals. What the first thing we are going to do with our front of line chatter is we're going to start rationalizing. I'm going to say, ah, oh, you must be a chef. This is not a problem. That's the way we work. Our goal with logic is to explain away everything and not to trust our intuition. Um, from the time we we're very young kids, we identify things about the world and make judgments based on our intuition. And we are told we are wrong. You know, we say, oh, is, is mommy sick? And we hear, no, 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 mommy's sleeping, it's gonna be fine. But we're right, you know, we have all of the tools, all of the observational skills to identify that scenario. Mommy is sick, but nobody wants to tell us. You get told enough times that your intuition is wrong, and you are gonna stop believing it, you're gonna start rationalizing for yourself. We get, uh, you know, we walk home at night and we feel like somebody is following us. All the times in your life that you haven't felt like someone was following you, they were just walking behind you, suddenly discounted. And you start telling yourself, oh, I watched a scary movie last night, I'm just being ridiculous here. Bro, I feel in a big city now, get it together. Why do you feel like they're following you? And not just walking behind you. Your body is telling you, I've seen a number of signals, just like the monkey. I've seen five or six signals that do not match my data. Be aware, be alert. What if fear is not this horrible thing we have to live in fear of? What if fear is just a survival signal? What if fear is our indication like anything else that something is not going right? When we taste something and it tastes really good, that's our indicator, hey, we should keep eating this, this is probably good for us. When we feel guilt, that's when we know we've gone against our own values. That's an indicator for us to look at what we did that made us feel guilty and make an assessment. Are my values wrong or did I go against my own values? That's our body telling us. Fear is nothing different. Fear is saying something in your environment is not right. You should be on high alert right now. Be aware. And we are so afraid of feeling this fear that we kind of push it away. And we simultaneously live in this culture of massive fear where all of our media fills us with nothing but the worst stories we could possibly hear, which statistically are not nearly as prevalent as they seem like they are based on how much we have to interact with. What are some examples of how we can obey this intuition? So the first example I like to give is, is something that actually happened to me recently, it was about six months ago. I had just gotten a haircut, and I usually like to give my barber cash because he's a good guy and I like to tip him hard, and so I get that first appointment. I didn't have my uh, I didn't have cash on me, I run down the street to the ATM. I walk in the street, and this older gentleman walks up to me and puts his hand up to shake my hand. And I just went with my feeling on this one. My feeling was, I don't want to shake this man's hand. And I said to him, I was like, dude, back off, and kept walking, and kind of like flipped out on me a little bit, yelling about how rude I am. But what actually happened here? You know, yeah, I feel rude. I feel like I was rude to this person. I feel like I wasn't polite. Is that a social norm? Is that a thing? Do we walk down city streets and people come out of their way to shake our hands? Did I happen to meet? the charter member of the Haircut Appreciation Society of Seattle just as I got a really good haircut? Or was this guy in the interview stage of the credit or credit process? This guy was looking for an opportunity to engage me and make us friends. So that when we were friends, I'd be more inclined to listen to whatever insane thing he was going to tell me that was probably going to end and asking for money. Now, I am a large man. I'm a self-defense instructor. I've been kickboxing for a very long time. I don't feel fear with general people in 90 different situations. What if I'm a five foot tall woman and I'm in a situation? This person approaches me and they make me feel like I'm obligated to interact with them. That's not 
a social norm. That's a sign of predator. Any good person is not going to put someone else in that situation. And if they do accidentally, when you say no and keep walking, they're going to think, oh, yeah, that was a social fail on my part. I'm going to keep walking. The people who argue with you, the people who yell at you, are not good people. Okay? Um, one of my students in my self-defense workshop shared a story about how when she was a teenager, her and her cousin were out walking and a man yelled at them from the car. He said, can you tell me what time it is? Okay. How often do adult men yell from cars to ask teenagers what time it is? Of course, they're teenagers. They don't really kind of have this social norm, and they felt a little pressure to go up and you know, interact with them. So they got a little closer with the car, and of course, where they got there, he was sitting in the car with no pants on, and got this, you know, this weird flasher thing. There's a lot of situations where, I mean, where we get a feeling. You know, you're sitting in a bar, there's someone across from you who's offered to buy you a drink, so you feel compelled to go at least engage in conversation. And this whole time, you just don't feel right. And what are you doing? You're telling yourself in your head, I'm being rude. Maybe be socially awkward. I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to upset them. I'm not going to make them feel bad about themselves. I'm not going to come off as bitchy or uptight. What's the difference between when a good guy sits down with you at a bar and you don't feel any of those things? You feel those things for a reason. Your supercomputer up there is awesome. Okay? It is making the right judgments. It's looking at what are his eyes doing? What is his speech pattern doing? What is he talking about? What is he focusing on? Is he invading your boundaries? Is he consistently ignoring your attempts to redirect the conversation? Is he trying to get you away from your friend or separate from the group? You know all of these things. Your brain does not care if you agree with the plan. Okay? You don't have time to assess all of these things. The idea of fight, flight, or freeze happens just like your computer. You open too many windows, you try to do too many things, it stops. That's what happens when your conscious mind tries to be in charge. When your conscious mind says, no, no, I'm going to examine this situation. I'm going to try to figure out all of the different things I'm doing. You're not smart enough to. Your subconscious, let's just say the 10% thing is valid, then your subconscious is 90%. So you're taking your tiny little calculator and trying to run it against your supercomputer. Just trust your supercomputer. That's all you need to do in this scenario. You're going to know what feels right, and you'll gradually get better at improving it. When does our intuition break? We talked about already when you're a kid and you identify these clear scenarios. Oh, mommy's sick. Oh, are you guys fighting? Oh, you're not fighting. Okay, because you definitely just threw a dish. <laughs> We get told all the time we don't see what we see. When people tell you your senses are not accurate and they're not valid, it makes it really hard to start trusting yourself. It makes it really hard to depend on your intuition. Another thing that jams up our intuition is this culture of fear idea. If we believe everybody is out to get us, if we believe everybody is a potential predator, it's going to make it very hard for us to know when we have actual predators. If you are a racist and you have decided that all persons of color are potential criminals, you have short circuit your intuition systems. Basically, the boy who cried wolf with everything. When you get an actual valid fear, you're not going to pick up the signal because that's all you feel. So this idea in self-defense that we need to perpetuate this culture of fear, we need to be prepared at all times. No, you need to live your life. You need to be happy. You need to be thoughtful. You need to look at the tools. You need to be healthy and happy, male or female. But you need to recognize that you have an intuition. When you start trusting that intuition in very little ways, simple ways, like you meet a new person and you think they're kind of a jerk, go with it. What's the worst that's going to happen? Your friend is just going to take your rude egg. We'll speak to you. Of my friend group, I am the most judgmental jerk in the group. I have never been wrong. Think of the time when you trusted your intuition on something small or something big and you were right. Think of the time when you went against your intuition and later got to nail a pretty solid I told you so when you broke up with that guy, okay? You are probably right if your intuition is not broken. So that's what I'm gonna leave you with today. Look for those opportunities in your life to use and trust your intuition. And when it comes to self-defense, you know, do what you wanna do. Take a class, I recommend reading Give to Fear, watch some YouTube videos, do whatever you're gonna do, but recognize that you will have everything you need into you to survive. We are animals designed for survival. It's really all we're going to kill continuing to survive. You have everything you need. That's all I got for today. Thank you.